Good morning, everyone. Um, so as Matt said, we're, this is an exploration of um, the many different um, disciplines, professions that are all kind of looking at this issue. And um, I think in Vermont, one of the things that's come out in the past uh, couple of years is, um, you know, the question of compatibility um, on of some of the interests on using the same parcel of, of land. So what we're looking at is can the grazing um, of livestock and pollinator friendly um, planting go hand in hand? Can they be compatible under the solar arrays? So the, um, we're gonna focus in this first panel on land management and project development and the technology options. And uh, Le first up here is Lexi Hain, who has taken this idea that had been talked about for a long time, and I've been very impressed with. She's taken it and run with it, and set up a um, an organization, a company over in New York State, where they do a solar grazing business. She's also the executive director of the American Solar Grazing Association, and she's doing these great. Um, webinars on Wednesday evenings, bringing in people from across the country for people to hear, um, you know, what's going on in other places. So she's got a presentation here called Opportunities and Benefits of Solar Grazing, and um, I'll let her take it from there. And Lexi, you can do a share screen. Ah, okay. Thank you, Kimberly, and good morning to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you also, Matthew, Alex, and the University of Vermont. Uh, delighted to be here. And let me see if I can get this to go as a slideshow. Uh-oh. <laughs> Come on. There we go. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Beautiful September days we're having here in upstate New York. Just out moving my flock this morning. And uh, just these blissful days that make you forget about winter. <laughs> so I um, do have a farm about 10 minutes west of Cornell in the Finger Lakes. And about, I'm not going to give you the whole history, I only have 10 minutes, but I did get into this about four years ago when I'd sold another business and I thought needed something to do that combined my different passions, both for farming and renewable energy. And so today I you know, I'm mostly wearing my hat where I do outreach, which is through the American Solar Grazing Association. And, uh, but I do have a solar grazing business, which has sort of provided the foundation for some of this material. And just fundamentally, probably many of you are familiar with this at this point, but kind of what is solar grazing? And I define it as using livestock to manage vegetation under solar arrays. And, you know, you do need a you do need a, a plan to manage the vegetation at solar arrays. This happens to be a single access tracker site in New Jersey. Those are a, a flock of Katahdin hair sheep that were just released that is uh, Princeton. And uh, the consequences of not man not thinking through the management or not managing it well, you know, are, are unfavorable for all parties. You you do want to see a plan for management that is affordable for the solar companies that uh, helps those photons go where they need to go and, and generate elect and, and get the electrons flowing. Um, and what we see just in the slide quickly is also a, a situation where the alleys have been mown and the, the, the harder to reach areas, the areas under the panels were neglected. Um, that might've been a budget issue, I don't know. And then also just the idea that, especially in somewhere like Vermont, you will need a plan to manage your array um, or you will have a small forest. I, in fact, inherited a site. I've been working for four years to get on another solar array. It's, it's a mile from my house and it's another 13 acres. And we have trees that we've been dealing with under the panels. Yes. <laughs> um, so kind of some of these other basic principles, if you're not familiar with sheep, they, they do, they are just um, like a harmonious fit for the solar, which is actually kind of what's happened. And there are in terms of like how, where did solar grazing come from? Well, what it came from was this pretty natural fit where people needed vegetation management and 
especially like in Europe where we first started seeing this practice, um, people are very conscious about land management there. And of course, there's a, a healthy and vibrant sheep industry in many parts of uh, the UK and uh, other parts of Europe and where solar was, ground mounted solar was getting installed. And so what people, people have all kinds of questions about, uh, you know, customizing solar sites for the sheep. And there certainly is some of that. But what I, I guess I can't emphasize enough is that fundamentally the sheep are compatible. And as you see right here under the panels, they flock to the portions of the array that are hard for machinery and equipment to deal with. Um, certainly there is research into robotic mowers and such, but I myself would much prefer to see our friends here. Um, and there are many other co-benefits for that. Uh, when I go out to check my flocks in the middle of the day, late, they are under the panels. They in fact graze along rows under the panels. In the mornings and the evenings, they uh, come out from under the panels um, and they graze in the alleys. Um, and as anyone who raises pastured livestock knows, having a lot of abundant shade really solves a lot of problems at once. Kim, I've got my timer on, but let's just see. So one thing that you know became clear to me when I first started doing this um, uh, better than four years ago now was that there were a few other people doing it and it, and it did potentially create another uh, viable opportunity for people to um, engage with the land and also to get another income stream. So um, these are pictures of people who helped found ASGA and um, the farmer in the middle actually is, that's Lewis Fox. He's a native to the Middlebury area, came from a dairy farm there and is a successful solar grazer. But um, I just wanted to emphasize that this in fact, you do derive another income stream because it is a paid management service because you need the, the farmers have to get paid for the additional work of bringing the sheep to the solar sites of managing your flocks away from home and um, and for running what is basically a secondary operation besides the at-home farm. Uh, this is just, I have a couple examples of some member farmers uh, who have figured out some of the systems around this. Uh, this is a family farm in Pennsylvania. They were experienced with sheep. They taught agricultural educators for years about, about sheep management. And they were given the opportunity said, at a nearby university to uh, bring their sheep there for pay. And this is, I think, the end of their second year grazing the solar site. And it, they have worked out a system that really works for them. They bring their dry use there. They work with a university student, a vet student, who does the daily flock checks and management. And it provides an additional income stream for their family. Uh, there's um, New Jersey. This is another member. She's in New Jersey. She has been quite a pioneer. Um, she has had to deal with very, very complicated solar systems. As you can see, there's a, a lot of managing of the cables uh, that happens at solar sites where the, where the panels move at these tracker sites. Um, she has now built her second barn in three years. Uh, she's up to uh, nearly 800 ewes. And she started as just a hobbyist who liked herding dogs. And that was about 10 years ago. So um, what you can see is somewhere like very improbable, like coastal New Jersey is getting um, a resurgence of agricultural economic uh, benefit uh, that trickles out to you know, new barns and veterinary services and so on. Uh, this is a snapshot of uh, my grazing business, Agrivoltaic Solutions. Uh, we uh, think this is our third year working together and we are now at a place where um, I think this year we're at about, I think it's eight solar arrays, about 160 acres worth of solar. Um, as you can see, each array is separately fenced. Um, we graze a number of different styles of ground mounted solar that the sheep do fine. Uh, we manage three separate flocks and then that's up to about 500 ewes across the, the, the portfolio. So we do do a managed grazing system. The flocks do not mix and we are able to control vegetation. We're at about 90%, 90 to 100% vegetation control uh, with the sheep. 
Uh, and we are mostly do dealing with solar sites that were not planned for solar grazing. So we've been dealing with all kinds of interesting vegetation and other uh, issues. Um, and just to let you know, this is also something that happens at scale. So uh, Invenergy uh, built a site a few years ago in Uruguay, South America. Uh, it's a 450 acre La Quinta solar site. Uh, it is managed entirely uh, with merino sheep. Uh, the contract to graze was for 20 years uh, with the firm FRV, which is an O&M firm, operations and maintenance firm out of Spain. And they have agronomists, they have full-time hired shepherds, and FRV installed a number of things such as permanent interior fencing, water lines, and other infrastructure. Um, they reckon the payback on that was seven years. And they were able to um, take advantage of uh, a, a compatible arrangement that made everyone happy and, and consequently actually Invenergy has now taken solar grazing quite seriously, which I'm happy to hear. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Uh, so there are, there, I host a lot of information on solargrazing.org, our website. Take one minute, Lexi, one minute. Oh, goody. <laughs> So you can look one there. I get asked a lot about prices and rates. And one thing I will say is that there are real costs for the farmers who engage in this. And I will also say that this is still an emerging industry. The rate that the real fundamental difference in the rates that you'll see here is that in New York state, you see some higher rates simply because the sample size was for these smaller arrays, they're called DG arrays, whereas the Eastern United States, we had a number of utility scale sites that brought down the dollars per acre of income for our farmers. I'm gonna just quickly go through a couple of the modifications you'll see on solar sites here in New York. Um, I manage some of these, some are managed by others, but interior paddock fencing is something. Um, you do have to be able to catch catch your sheep at the end or catch your sheep when they run out of forage, which certainly has happened. Um, I use herding dogs and I use uh, temporary, uh, I use handling systems and, and pretty much everyone else uses some combination of grain buckets, handling systems, and so on. Um, if you're Vermont and you're making permits around this, I would love to see permanent water supplies installed at your solar sites. And I would also like to see attention to fencing. As you can see, I've modified that fencing there. Fencing that uh, keeps my sheep safe because in this case, I'm 30 miles from home and I really can't be up at night worrying about the coyotes. Uh, please do uh, join, uh, join ASGA. There's tons of information on our website. And then we also have a lot of free information like our free solar grazing calls once a month. And we now have a solar grazing map, which I encourage everyone to say, if you're a farmer and you want to get involved with solar grazing, put yourself on the map. And then if you are a solar company and you want to reach out to grazers, put yourself on the map. So that is all launched this summer. And I'm so delighted by that. And thank you so much for having me. Wish you luck with us. All right. Thanks, Lexi. That was great. Oh, good. Fun. Oh. I'll stick around for questions, yeah. All right, great. Um, Matt, do you know if Olivia is on? I believe Olivia is on. Okay. Olivia, are you there? Hey guys. Excellent. Olivia, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself um, I, because I don't have that information. <laughs> And um, and then if you can just do a share screen, that would be great. Okay, great. Well, um, my name is Olivia Campbell Anderson, and it's my pleasure to lead Renewable Energy Vermont. Uh, for folks that first, actually, let me say, I also want to say thank you to UVM um, and the Ag Extension, the Agency of Agriculture, for convening this conversation. Um, we're ac we actually really appreciate um, and are excited uh, about the collaboration that's happening already and that we think really has opportunity and need to grow uh, between Vermont's renewable energy and agricultural sectors. Um, so again, my name is Olivia. I lead Renewable Energy Vermont. We are the nonprofit Clean Energy Trade Association. Um, our members are committed to reducing uh, 
uh, the use reliance on dirty fossil fuels by increasing local renewable energy and energy efficiency in Vermont. Um, REV is the driving force that created the opportunities for solar to be built in Vermont. Um, and uh, we are, are thankful for all of you know, everyone's support in, in that vision to doing our part on climate and meeting our um, state's commitments. I am uh, gonna talk uh, a little bit about um, what's going on with solar in Vermont right now. Um, you know, some highlights of benefits of solar and agriculture, the status of Vermont, growth barriers and challenges to uh, the connections um, and opportunities of farmers and solar uh, working together. Um, and, uh, and then look forward to the conversation late, uh, as we continue. So uh, Vermont farmers have a proud tradition of turning the sun's energy into productive use. That's what they do nearly every day. Um, and we, um, many of them and Rev, you know, we believe that producing clean local renewable energy is, is really an increasingly vital component of Vermont's modern agricultural economy. Um, you know, we know that solar provides farmers with options to diversify their income stream, keep their land and agricultural production, operate more, uh, uh, operate farms that are more self-reliant and um, resilient local businesses. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, what we have experienced is that these projects, uh, local solar projects are creating stable income for landowners and farmers when agricultural commodity prices and weather are completely out of their control. And I can't tell you how many REV members and also myself you know, we um, we see the challenges um, and the hardships and the hard work that Vermont farmers are going to, through, and it literally breaks our heart um, uh, because these are our neighbors, and we want to see more opportunities uh, for agriculture to um, continue to thrive in our state. And we think that renewable energy, particularly solar, is a great partner to help with that. Um, so here, uh, this uh, first this slide shows some pictures of I think other panelists and some work good work of folks that have joined us for the conversation today. But you know we have projects um, where uh, you know sheep are are grazing regularly under solar panels. Um, uh, there are um, projects, I know Mike's on, um, where, you know, honey is happening, uh, honey making is happening under solar panels, UVM, um, you know, in, uh, worked with Peck Electric and, you know, has found that uh, saffron is actually, you know, in their uh, first year of their study, saffron that was growing under solar panels had a 14% higher yield. Um, which is incredible. You know, there's a lot of crops that are quite complementary. Um, and uh, we've even had uh, one project in Vermont where um, it was intentionally designed and integrated to um, have cattle grazing um, underneath uh, of the solar panels that were supporting um, uh, meat operations. Um, and, and that took some intentional design work, <laughs> but um, so we, you know, we see this as an opportunity and we want to see more of it. Um, uh, there, oh, actually, let me, and then pollinator friendly solar. I think many people are probably familiar with this, but um, I'm going to give a huge shout out to Mike Kiernan at Be The Change because this summer we've had a, um, you know, reached a milestone of really, I think this work has been going on in Vermont for just about three years. And um, now we have more than 20, at least more than 20 um, uh, fairly significantly sized solar projects that are under pollinator friendly vegetation management that improves the soil quality and crop yields. Um, on, on that and neighboring and helps create habitat that did not previously exist 
for native species with um, the plantings that are underneath. Um, and there's a whole website. We launched a pledge with our members. Um, and what I'm seeing is this uh, po uh, polar fr pollinator friendly planting under solar is actually really starting to become the norm um, for, uh, um, for field um, solar arrays uh, in Vermont. Uh, because of the many benefits. And I'll, I'll let the farmers and those that are doing those projects talk about that in more detail later. But um, so we have, <clears throat> um, we have about uh, 350 megawatts of solar installed in Vermont to date. And that's just 17% of what we need to meet our climate and renewable energy commitments in the state, uh, consistent with our state's comprehensive energy plan. Um, and so there's three main policies that um, without those, the, the solar we have today would not exist. Um, the first one is, and these were all established by the legislature. Uh, the first one is with Rev's advocacy, um, including, uh, I think, some uh, legislators uh, that may be joining us today. The first one is um, Standard Offer. It's a competitive procurement program for, um, uh, I would say, small-scale utility size projects um, up to uh, two megawatts in Vermont. Um, the other is net metering. Uh, net metering is the really the only option if a farmer wants to install, choose to install solar and power their farm with local solar. Um, net metering uh, is our state policy that enables that. And then the third is the renewable energy standard in Vermont. This requires utilities to meet a certain percentage of their electricity from local renewables. Um, so there's been a handful of utility projects that have, have gone forward because of that. We wouldn't have solar without these state laws. Um, and so one, uh, so I'm gonna talk more, a little bit more about that. So moving ahead, I just wanna touch on to start the day, what we see as some barriers and opportunities ahead for how there can be greater uh, complements um, and an opportunity uh, for solar in our working landscape. Um, the first is wetlands. Um, it's uh, in Vermont, it's pretty near impossible to, um, have uh, solar on a wet meadow now, and that's largely because uh, despite, despite five years of independent study assessing the impact of, of solar in wetlands, and which, which all show there's no impact, or in some instances actually improved uh, wetland habitat in terms of plantings and, and hydrology, uh, compared to previous agricultural activity on those less productive um, lands. Um, it's, it's impossible and extreme or too costly um, to uh, get a permit uh, from the state agency of uh, agency of natural resources. Um, and so the, the wetlands permitting process in Vermont um, kills many farmers opportunities to host solar on their land. Um, even when the farmer knows and we know and scientists know that doing so would actually improve water quality and, and the wetlands habitat by, in some cases, restoring wetlands where you may literally have um, cattle doing their business um, uh, and, and, and causing uh, phosphorus issues um, and, and we're bringing that land back um, and that's not even the best use of the land um, farmers often wouldn't would prefer you know to do something else with that portion of their farm so the so that's one area that is uh, a huge barrier right now in Vermont the other is current use um, I, I I'm just going to assume minutes, Olivia. what two minutes 
Okay. The other is current use. I'm going to assume everyone in Vermont knows about current use uh, with the tax structure, but there's really no complementary allowed use in state law, even for small farms that are in the current use program to have operation um, on property that is not on their home or on their agricultural structure, barn structures, etc. cetera. Um, and that's a quick and easy fix. Um, uh, the other is uh, local resilience in our grid constraints. Many farmers um, are finding that they would like to host solar. It's, uh, they could use the energy on their farm and provide extra sometimes to their neighbors, but they can't connect because their local distribution grid is inadequate. Um, and then the final one I would just highlight on is interagency regulatory contradiction. It's not uncommon for a um, solar project to go through permitting and receive contradictory or differing response to the permit from the Agency of Agriculture, the, um, the, and, and the Agency of Natural Resources, where natural resources is like, get it out of that wetlands buffer, um, or we don't want you to cut a couple trees for shading. And then the Department of Agriculture is like, get it out of the prime ag soil and so you're moving all around and it would be really great if there was more of a path for agencies to actually talk to each other on projects because this increases the cost significantly and unnecessarily um and then i just on the grid issue uh as we as we wrap up here um this is a the green mountain power maintains uh a solar map and so this is a, a snapshot of that map from yesterday. Um, now, the gray areas in the north, GMP doesn't serve the entire state, but every area that is red, orange, or yellow on this map is pretty darn difficult to impossible to install a solar project. And this means that all of these landowners and all of these farmers uh, do not have that as an opportunity. And this is a real problem when we talk about community resilience um, and farmers even having their own choices on what they can do to support their farm and generate their own electricity. Um, I'm gonna, I know uh, we're, someone else is I'm sure gonna talk about siting and preferred sites. Right now, due to current regulations, the only way for a new solar project to be sited on, uh, um, of the working landscape is if the town has designated it as an approved location, the, the town and the Regional Planning Commission, or if it's 50% um, of the electricity is going to the, um, the customer on the site, the hosting farm. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of challenging. You know, the state regulations have said, we don't want solar on farms. Um, and so in terms of new projects, it makes it really challenging. Um, and so I just want to wrap up back with, um, you know, the, the, of all of those, you know, there are other things like, you know, local property taxes and inconsistent treatment for farmers, um, siting challenges, but the, the biggest policy right now that we are seeing as limiting is the renewable energy standard in that, um, the way that the, our regulators at the Department of Public Service are currently treating the renewable energy standard is for to literally limit utilities um, from generating not more than 10% of the electricity that their customers need and that Vermont needs from local um, small renewables. And so um, that's a real challenge um, to growth uh, in, in saying that you can't have more than 10%. And so we've been having a lot of conversations at the legislature uh, about addressing this, um, this big barrier. Um, and so, hmm? I think so we, we gotta, welcome yeah. the conversation and okay. um, encourage folks to, to get engaged on some of these uh, policy issues with us. Yeah. This is great. That was great, Olivia. Thank you. I um, I really hear <clears throat> what, and I'm sure that there's more to come on this. But um, yeah, I 
I know that this is a, um, a problem in, in a couple of areas, um, not just in uh, renewable energy, but the conflict between agencies not and the lack of communication between agencies um, and the use of agricultural land is, is quite vexing. Anyway, um, thanks. That was uh, really informative. I learned a lot from you. Um, next, we've got Jordan Macknick. Um, Jordan, are you there and ready? I'm here and ready. Okay. So Jordan is the lead energy waterland analyst at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, he's principal investigator of the Department of Energy's INSPIRE project, which through its network is evaluating the intersection between solar and agriculture at 25 field sites across the country. And Jordan's uh, presentation is Agriculture and Solar Together, the Department of Energy's INSPIRE project. And take it away, Jordan, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Kimberly. Uh, so uh, as Kimberly mentioned, I'm with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which if you're not familiar, is a Department of Energy run uh, research organization. It is the, the nation's premier facility for developing new renewable energy technologies, as well as better understanding how those can be incorporated into the existing grid uh, and, and broader society. So uh, some of the motivation for why we're here is obviously that, you know, solar development is, is booming. States have, have renewable energy goals, uh, of which solar is going to play a, an important part. And there's really not enough rooftop space to support this. This is combined with the fact that we've, we're seeing farm profitability uh, facing challenges, an aging uh, set of farmers that is making it uh, you know, very appealing for, for agriculture, for solar developers uh, to develop on, on agricultural land. And there's, you know, obviously as in a state like Vermont, uh, you are uh, land limited uh, as opposed to where I am in, in Colorado. Uh, and there's, there can be some of these uh, trade-offs between agriculture and solar. The, what we're talking about is how do we make these, these two things more compatible? as well as how do we make sure that when we, when we do have solar development, uh, instead of looking like what we might see on the left, it looks more uh, like what we might see on the right, uh, where we could see you know, lush vegetation and things that are really benefiting the soil and benefiting surrounding communities. So our vision uh, with, uh, with solar development is that when solar development happens, that it you know it, it it provides some benefit either for the soil on site or for the surrounding community, and this could be through things like pollinator habitat, through the grazing which we've discussed, or through the actual on site development of of crops and, and growing agri you know food crops, agricultural crops, uh, whether whether they're vegetables or herbs or other beneficial uh, speed, uh, and other beneficial crops, so is to address that, uh, I think the, the bottom line is, I think we all appreciate the, 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 the possibility of this, uh, but the focus of the, the INSPIRE project is to really provide some quantitative data and to perform some research to help show what are the, the types of crops, what are the types of grasses that would function best and perform best underneath this partial uh, shade environment of solar panels. Uh, we're doing this across the nation, and, and really it's, it's trying to get at some of these, these more fundamental questions of what difference does it make if you have elevated panels or not? What happens if you spread your, your panels spacings out uh, more? You know, what are the different types of um, operating practices that are compatible or not compatible with solar? We're really trying to provide some foundational quantitative data that can help inform uh, decisions that landowners might make, that farmers might make, and that solar developers might make in deciding whether or not they should pursue something like agrivoltaics and what it might actually look like. So as part of that, as Kimberly mentioned, we've got over 25 different field sites that are located across the country uh, where we are looking at these things. And specifically, we're looking at uh, the impacts of pollinator habitat on, on soil, as well as on insect species and surrounding farm production. We're looking at uh, crop production, and then we're also looking at grazing activities uh, through a series of, of sites. 
importantly, our, our research is, is backed and is informed by uh, a, a wide variety of, of partners across the country uh, from different sectors who are interested in this and who are trying to make, you know, making sure that all of our research sort of stays on target and, make, and, and is meeting the most uh, relevant and pressing needs of the industry. Uh, some of our site, you know, as you can see, uh, some of our sites, we are growing crops in between the rows. So you can see in Oregon, we're growing crops in between rows, whereas in Massachusetts, we're growing crops directly underneath panels. In the Midwest and the Northeast, we've got a number of sites looking at, at pollinator habitat. But I think it, essentially the bottom line is there's, we're, we're using consistent methods across each of these sites to help us better understand and hopefully we can transfer some of our learnings and some of our insights from one site uh, to another. At, each, at most of our sites, uh, we have been installing instrumentation uh, that, that we are using to collect information about things like soil carbon, soil moisture, uh, the impacts that these different practices will have on, on the environment, as well as on the solar panels themselves. Uh, we're also, we have you know, set protocols for how we would collect data as it relates to crop production, as well as for pollinator uh, and other beneficial insects as we, as we go through these, uh, these different sites. We have standardized protocols that we use, again, to try to provide some consistency and some transferability from some results across different sites. Uh, and then I'll, I'll give you a good example of, a, of what one of our, or three of our sites in Minnesota, which I think could serve as a good model for something that could be done in Vermont as well, which is where uh, at three of these sites, we are looking at uh, nine different seed mixes underneath the panels to see really, to, again, to see what grows best underneath the solar array, because it is a, it still is an ongoing question, the types of, of species that perform best underneath the, that partial shade environment. Uh, we're also then monitoring the pollinator species and their impact and their, uh, their, their populations uh, and their abundance uh, at, at different times of the year. We're performing a, an ecological services analysis, looking at what is the monetary value that's provided by uh, this habitat, uh, as well as the uh, impacts on our, on our soil quality, as well as reducing erosion. Uh, the, the sites are fully instrumented so we can better understand uh, soil moisture, uh, microclimate changes, as well as PV performance differences. And we also have these located in three different, uh, three different locations within Minnesota that have diverse soil and ecotypes. And so and this, this study has already been ongoing for uh, three years. We'll be going for at least five years on this site and so on, on these, these three sites here. So I think this is a type of comprehensive research that I think could really benefit, um, uh, you know, Vermont to pursue as well. And I also think, you know, given the, uh, the, the relevance of grazing, you could also add in some, some grazing elements here as well. Uh, one of the outcomes from some of our earlier research did point out to the fact that if, if uh, the existing solar arrays were planted that are in, you know, in the United States right now, uh, were planted with, with pollinator friendly vegetation, that would benefit over 800,000 acres of agricultural land, uh, you know, land that is with basically within a mile of those sites that is pollinator dependent. And so that's something to think about as well, uh, not only the, the benefits on site, but also the surrounding benefits that pollinator habitat can provide to, to surrounding agriculture. Obviously, uh, when you do have pollinators, it allows for, for apiaries and honey production, which also allows for some additional value added project uh, products from that which again can help serve as a, an economic boost and an economic incentive uh, to do this for, for landowners or for other um, agricultural operators as well. Uh, when we talk about growing crops, here's our Massachusetts uh, test facility. And I think one of the important lessons learned, you'll see on the right side, uh, we were growing broccoli there. And depending on where you have your broccoli situated uh, underneath these panels, it can greatly determine if you have broccoli heads, this, you know, the size of your head or broccoli heads the size of your, your fist. And so these are some of the lessons that we're, we're learning uh, from growing different types of agricultural crops under different types of solar configurations uh, throughout the country. We've also got an Arizona site uh, where we are seeing much more dramatic benefits in agriculture because it's such an arid area, uh, but we are, can still see some measurable, be measurable benefits uh, in the Northeast as well. Uh, grazing, obviously, uh, you know, Lexi and Olivia talked about some of the grazing activities that are happening. I, I don't need to go into that. 
Uh, I also say there's opportunities for floating solar on agricultural operations where you don't necessarily need to put uh, solar panels on the ground. You can put them on, on water bodies, which can help save, your, save uh, precious agricultural land. And then I'll close with just highlighting a few different uh, two, two major outcomes from our, our work, which is that uh, this is very much a, a new field and we're learning a lot as we go uh, in terms of best practices and in terms of what really works best. And it's been an, an amazing educational opportunities, not only for uh, elementary school and, and college uh, students that we've been working with, uh, but also for state agencies and also for consulting companies and the solar developers that we're partnering with across the country. Uh, and I think you know, the lessons uh, that we've learned are really gonna be important for informing new policy and informing new best practices that companies will take going forward on incorporating these agricultural elements into solar. I think we're gonna see it uh, rapidly increase in the next few years. And lastly, uh, we have partnered uh, very frequently with other state agencies and other major companies as they do decide uh, you know, what sorts of, of policies might make sense or what the impacts of policies might be, how to develop these policies in a way that, that really benefits uh, the state as a whole. And so uh, it's been a very, uh, you know, rewarding experience for us to engage not only with farmers, not only with solar developers, uh, but also with, uh, with, with state agencies as they embark on this because there can be an important implications, uh, as Olivia mentioned, for, for state policies and how they could have direct or indirect impacts on, on solar, as well as on how you integrate solar with agriculture going forward. So with that, I, I will close up uh, and I, I look forward to the questions that will occur uh, later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, that was great. I love how we're seeing that there's already um, so many forays into this compatibility issue um, across the country that people are just already jumping on it and moving on it. It's great. Um, so our last um, panelist on this first panel is Evan Abramson, um, who is the principal at Landscape Interactions, um, an interdisciplinary landscape planning and design firm that specializes in the creation and restoration of native landscapes to benefit the threatened pollinator species. So uh, Evan's going to share with us his presentation, which is Wild Solar, uh, Designing Biodiverse Pollinator Habitat on PV Landscape. And Evan, you there and ready? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Kimberly. Sure. And um, thanks to everyone for setting this up. Um, I, um, I'm going to take a one hour presentation and turn it into 10 minutes. So I'll just get started here. So, um, just a little bit about my company. Um, we, we are doing a number of, uh, pollinator friendly solar projects, um, mostly in Massachusetts, but across the Northeast. And, um, we are creating, um, habitats that not only benefit native pollinators specifically, but also target threatened Lepidoptera and um, pollen specialist bees, which I think is so important to talk about. Um, I usually begin my presentations by talking about where we are historically. We're in the age of the Anthropocene. And as many of you probably know, as many as 30 to 50% of all species on the planet are heading towards extinction by the middle of this century. Um, insects are also on severe decline. Um, at the current rate of decline, we could lose all insects on the planet, according to the latest research, and habitat loss is cited as the most pressing problem. Um, also, just last year, um, a study came out, North America has lost uh, one in four birds over the past 50 years. Again, habitat loss being the most direct cause. So you can see the the movement across the trophic levels of ecosystems. So why do we target pollinators in this uh, work? Well, basically they um, assist over 80% of the world's flowering plants, which includes um, many trees, deciduous trees like maples. Um, in Massachusetts and widely across the Northeast, bees pollinate between 33 and 45% of all food crops. And um, many bees are pollen specialists, which means that they only pollinate um, certain species or genus of plants. 
So what are the needs of a bee when you're looking at a landscape scale project? Well, um, there's about 4,000 um, native bees in the US and we've got nearly 10% of them in the Northeast. And um, in a global study that looked at 40 food crops across 600 different agricultural fields, wild pollinators were twice as effective as honeybees in producing seeds and fruit. So again, the focus for us, and I feel like for everyone with regard to pollinator habitat, restoration should be wild pollinators, not managed pollinators like honeybees, because they are the ones that are doing the majority of our food crop pollination and they are certainly the ones that are most important for ecosystem health and resiliency. There's obviously a lot of other pollinators out there. We know about the monarch butterfly and the hummingbird. In the Northeast, we've got the ruby-throated. There's also very specific butterflies and moths that inhabit only certain ecosystem types. And knowing that, knowing your landscape, knowing your location will guide, hopefully, which Lepidoptera species and even which pollinators, uh, bee species you target. Not all sites are the same um, and not all locations are the same as far as what plants to select to benefit which species, which may be under threat in your area. So um, most efforts to create pollinator habitat, unfortunately, have focused on simply increasing the numbers of common bee species. Um, seeing lots of bees on the landscape does not mean that your area or your site is necessarily pollinator friendly. Worldwide, there are over 300,000 species of flowering plants, and there are over 200,000 species of animal pollinators. So uh, it's quite diverse. And just having plants with flowers that bees are hovering around doesn't even necessarily mean that you're helping the ecosystem. You might just be encouraging common species to be in higher abundance. And that's really oftentimes the, the case. I'm gonna skip ahead with the next video. It shows the relationship of uh, pollen, really what is a specialist plant pollinator relationship, but our time is limited. So I have to move on, unfortunately. Uh, looking at Massachusetts, where we're based, um, if you look at the data on the right hand of the screen, you'll see that historically there were a lot more bumblebee species that were uh, present than there are today, which are the red color. So again, what one bumblebee wants or needs is not the same for every bumblebee species. And what's been going on today across the Northeast is that Bumbus impatiens, which is the common Eastern bumblebee, their numbers are actually higher than they were historically, where you can see right here where my mouse is hovering, but um, every other bumblebee species is at way lower levels. They're really verging on extinction or extirpation from our region. So those are the species that we're targeting with our plant selection on our sites. Here's some case studies of some of our work. I'll start with solar. Um, in Massachusetts, um, the DOER launched a pollinator habitat adder for solar projects, and they're actually incentivizing economically um, approximately $3,500 per megawatt per year for sites that are meeting pollinator friendly certification by the University of Massachusetts Clean Energy Extension. So we are currently designing at Landscape Interactions, my company, um, 15 sites across Massachusetts, which are either currently certified by UMass or um, applying for that this year. And um, these sites range anywhere from five or 10 acres up to 20 or 30 acres. And as you can see here, a number of them are actually clear cuts in uh, forested landscapes, which is not my choice, but that's where they bring me in. All projects require a multi-year habitat establishment and maintenance plan, which we develop. Uh, we survey the sites with a botanist and myself, and um, the seeds and the plants selected for the sites at least a third of them have to be documented through scientific research to support pollen specialist bees and or lepidopter of conservation concern. They all must be neonicotinoid and pesticide free, native to the county level, and there can be no rare or endemic plant species on the sites unless the seed or plant source is from within the state. 
there also needs to be a comprehensive invasive species strategy, which all of which we develop as part of our plan. So here's a few examples of some of our sites. I had to uh, blank out the um, road names and things because I'm not really allowed to share that information, but you can see here that this is the existing conditions of a solar site. It was completely forested. And then we came up with a series of different seed mixes, which met, they actually exceeded the UMass criteria by a significant amount, um, as well as a uh, maintenance plan for the site, looking at different maintenance strategies, whether it's mowing schedules and heights or invasive species removal. In this case, this site had zero invasive species at the time of the uh, construction. Um, to uh, meet the UMass guidance. And this is gonna be a 20 year long uh, process of recertification every three years. Um, we do the web, the web soil survey as well as on the ground data. They also uh, require at UMass that the fences be, um, I believe it's six to 12 inches of uh, gap above the ground so that wildlife can pass. Um, and we are documenting um, emergent species, even right after construction. Uh, right here, you have um, some native um, um, spring ephemerals coming up right after the site was cleared. And all of that is informing the plant selection for the site. Here's what the sites look like um, during and right after construction. So you can see we're really working with a blank slate on a lot of these slides, sites. And, um, if we didn't come in with uh, diverse pollinator habitat and just simply put in grass, well, I don't think that that would be a net gain for ecosystems or carbon sequestration, but with the diverse habitat that we're creating, um, we are certainly creating something that is much more biodiverse than what was there before, because what was basically there before was uh, an alpine forest that had very few um, canopy species diversity and almost no um, understory vegetation. Two minutes. Uh, one more minute or two? Two. All right, so I'll just give you guys a quick look at some of our other projects besides solar because all of this plays into how we look at plants and pollinator diversity. This is a um, vegetable, organic vegetable farm and after the proposed conversion to pollinator habitat, looking at different parts of the site different plant species selection, all of which is taking into account existing conditions of the site, drainage, as well as the goals of the landowner. Um, I'm also studying, starting this year, I've been looking at grazing biodiversity. I have a small um, flock of sheep with a guard llama, and we are uh, looking at uh, the impacts of grazing, um, rotational grazing, moving the flock every uh, one to two days on an almost entirely native grass and forb and shrub landscape. So this is a landscape that has almost 95% native plants and the impacts of that grazing. So you can see here, they're grazing on big blue stem, um, some emergent um, agricultural grasses that were under the native um, forbs and grasses. There's little blue stem, which the sheep tend to avoid. Um, and um, I'm interested certainly in talking about that with others here on the panel. Um, if we could do a study that would actually look at pollinator species diversity at the species level with regards to grazing on native landscapes. Um, here's a, just an example of um, a design where we really target at risk pollinators on all of our work. So again, we're not targeting common species. We're not targeting honeybees we're targeting threatened species because those are the species that really need help and that are key to biodiversity. Um, and when you're creating a corridor, there's been some discussion of a corridor uh, in my conversations with UVM and others here today. You know, you really have to look at everything from ownership and uh, proximity to other habitat, as well as even access, ease of maintenance, current conditions and long-term plans for the site. Um, on most of our sites, we monitor bumblebee species distributions over a three year period. So we look at basically a before and after. What were the bumblebee species on the site before we began? And what are the species that came after the habitat was uh, implemented and uh, installed? And what new species have arrived as a result? And that I think is the best way to document changes in biodiversity. 
Um, so this is my website. You can reach out to me here and I look forward to taking uh, questions and comments. Thank you. All right, thank you. That was great. Um, see, Stephanie, you uh, asked me a question, right? <laughs> Yeah. Hi, Kimberly. This is Matt. Um, Hi. I think Stephanie is going to offer one question that can go to the whole panel just out of interest of time. And then we would welcome people to continue on the chat, but we just want to make sure that we give people their uh, needed mid-morning break. To, uh, sure. Uh, that sounds like a good plan. Yeah. So a question that keeps coming up sort of at the beginning was whether it's possible on the same site to have both grazing and pollinator friendly landscapes and if there's a uh, timing that's appropriate for kind of bringing grazers on maybe after a long flowering season. Um, I know Evan started to kind of get into the combination thing but if other panelists have a comment on that that would be wonderful. Uh, my quick comment is that um, I've sort of worked pretty hard to make sure that grazing and pollinators are not at odds. Um, and certainly in Vermont, you can understand why you do need to somehow manage, you have to plan the, the vegetation management. Um, I would say that it, you know, and, and what Evan's studying is interesting to me. Uh, it, I'm really interested in seeing um, grazing and solar friendly blends that, that are non-toxic to sheep. So you could, when you're developing seed mixes and you're doing these research trials, I would like to see things that, you know, obviously sheep thrive and grow well on, but some thoughtfulness about non-toxic species. I would also like to say that we at ASGA, along with uh, Ernst Conservation Seeds and some folks at Cornell, did develop a seed mix. Um, it has two variations. It's called Fuzz and Buzz. You can buy it. This is the first year, and I know it's been installed on many hundreds of acres. Um, it has a standard and a premium, and I'm not trying to sell it. I'm just sort of letting you know it's a template that, that is out there and getting installed on solar sites um, because it was trying to solve these complicated sets of questions. Um, and the other thing, and it is really a template. So it's under development, and I'm hoping to see it sort of change and spread, and perhaps uh, Jordan and I can talk later about what's happening in Minnesota. That's great. The second comment I just have quickly is there um, is an ongoing research trial. Um, this is the end of the first full year um, at Cornell. Um, I keep the information on the ASGA website and it will be uh, October, our call in October, so the first Wednesday in October. Um, it'll be free and open to the public, but it is exactly asking that question. Native pollinator species under Dr. Scott McArt, um, uh, soil carbon sequestration and solar grazing at different plot densities with the Cornell sheep program. So I really hope you come some see it because we know this is an important question. Question. I'll let the other panelists answer now. Yeah, I I also want to just thanks, Lexi. That's great, and I'm I'm pretty excited about the whole fuzz and buzz seed mix. I've been wanting to find a place we could try it out here in Vermont. Um, the other thing I just wanted to add here is that the, the great thing, why one of the things that makes sheep so compatible with the solar um, arrays too, is that they are able to um, eat a much wider variety of plants than some of our other grazing species. Um, you know, so they're really great about um, just nibbling a little bit of everything and, and being able to handle it and we can get a couple of products from them uh, as a result of that. And you can't quite do that with cows and goats are also problematic. So um, they are the ideal combination for solar arrays. And that's all I'm gonna say as a grazing person. <laughs> One thing I wanted to just mention, um, what we're seeing in Massachusetts with the DOER um, adder is that companies are really jumping to do pollinator friendly now because it's being incentivized by the state. And I really think if that is not a part of the equation, you're really gonna just end up with the cheapest possible seed mixes. And I know this because my clients are the solar companies. Um, they want the cheapest possible mixes and they don't really care about much beyond the economics unless it's just sort of like a publicity thing in most cases. So. I think it would be great for Vermont to really uh, grapple with that question 
because these mixes that we're creating average about $900 to $1,200 per acre. And other companies have created mixes that are $7,000 per acre. And I've actually had companies come to me and say, well, we, our consultant created a mix that was so expensive, we can't afford it. Can you create a mix that's less expensive that still meets the requirements? So the economics behind that um, really have a lot to do with the incentive at the state level. Evan, I'm going to just jump to follow that my, I do think the adder is valuable and there's that six cent adder for upfront. But what I see happening in Massachusetts, because I've got members who are solar grazers there, is that you still ha you have so many people with, la with lawn mowers. And right now, with this, maybe it's the economy, but they're competing against low bid landscapers still. So the project is developed. Maybe they make a couple accommodations. But on, on very complex solar sites, and certainly a bunch of these low, low mounted solar sites with a lot of um, wiring and racking that's very challenging, the sheep can out compete dollar for dollar and certainly can out compete people with uh, weed whackers. Um, but on these l like large flat solar sites, the landscapers are winning the bids. And so what I really want to emphasize is Vermont needs to come up with ways for ongoing incentives to support these farmers, okay? And agricultural benefits and all of this sort of stuff. It can't just be an upfront little um, carrot, so. Well, the thing is in, in Massachusetts is that the adder um, kicks in the minute you're certified and then they are, um, they get the adder every year and, and they get the adder every year that they are um, certified and then the certification is renewed every three years. So let's take a 10 megawatt solar site. Um, well, I'm sorry, a five megawatt solar site. So that's okay. five times $3,500 per year. That outcompetes mowing grass. And it certainly outcompetes bringing in, um, unfortunately, it outcompetes a lot of other things like sheep because they're actually making money off of this. But it's great at the ecosystem level and at the regional level. I mean, a clear cut forest turning into grass, I don't think is a good um, before and after effect of solar. And unfortunately, Massachusetts, just the way that the SMART program is um, arranged, there is no difference between a clear cut and putting solar on an existing field, a farm field or a fallow field, they still get the same benefits under the SMART program. That's a criticism of the SMART program that I hold. But since we're working within that framework, well, the best thing we can do at this point is create diverse habitat, which is what the pollinator adder incentivizes on an annual basis. Okay. I just, I'm just going to cut in for just a moment. We will have more opportunity for a, a breakout group. I just want to make sure we can uh, hear from Jordan and Olivia on this question of integration and then uh, see that we have time for our, our break. Jordan? Sure. And I, I mean, I honestly, I don't have much to add beyond what I think Lexi and the other folks have, have said. We have found that it is feasible, it is possible to, to integrate them. It's a matter of planning and it's a matter of timing. And so the, and what we've seen in Minnesota, uh, it's happening now and it's being successful. If I could interrupt to ask Jordan a different question. <laughs> um, you did get a question in the chat that's another one of these overarching questions. If you could kind of bullet point a few lessons learned um, from the DOE project uh, about what seems useful in terms of incentivizing uh, different practices, if you will, in terms of incentivizing the way developers and regulators approach these projects, any kind of lessons learned you might be able to respond to there. Sure, yeah, and I think this question is coming from, from Adam. Uh, yes. Crary, but the, uh, you know, our lessons from this are that communication is, is, is absolutely essential and early communication uh, really is, is how to make this happen. Uh, what we have found is that, you know, when, whether we're going to do pollinator habitat or grazing or crop production, uh, each side is going to be motivated by different, uh, different reasons and, and different things. And so, uh, we found it's been very, very helpful to talk about what are our stated goals. So if you're a solar developer, you're likely most interested in things that are going to improve your bottom line. They're going to help you, you know, make 
this existing project not only in you know cost effective but all the future projects that you do even more cost effective if you're a regulator you're much you're probably interested in the entire landscape and making sure that what you do on any individual site is going to you know lead to lessons learned and more of a blueprint for how each new project should be developed and then if you're a landowner you know again you're looking for maybe improvements in your soil improvements in your in your bottom line as well and maybe the ability to continue your agricultural activity and so I, I, again i think you know what we've found is that putting you know express, explicitly stating what each player's goals are and, you know, sort of having an agreement or, a, you know, where you all lay that out can be really helpful in, in, in doing that. Uh, you know, and there's a good example that we have in, in Colorado in Longmont, you know, there was a, uh, a project that's just being finished for construction right now where we'll be doing research on it uh, over the next three years uh, called Jack Solar Garden. But that project was was not going to be allowed by the local Boulder County regulators uh, because it was on prime agricultural land, and so we had to work and sit down with the Boulder County regulators and and really explain to them what benefits this project could have with the pollinator habitat, with the crop production, and with pasture grass that it could actually benefit Boulder County. Uh, and again, that was made possible because we you know we got from Boulder County why they had this regulation, what its purpose was, and we were able to talk with them about, you know, how this project could be designed such that it met their needs, as well as meeting the solar developers needs, as well as meeting the farmer, the landowners needs. And so I think that's a, a good success story of where we we're able to change regulations based on talking through and educating them about what the benefits of these projects could be. Olivia, I believe you have the last word for our, our Q and A. Well, uh, I I think we uh I, I think let's just see how we can keep it going. The real challenge is here. I think in addition to the others I mentioned in Vermont, is how do we move beyond pilot stage, or for projects to um, make it as we are seeing with the pollinator friendly solar more of a normal uh, an on and. Uh, um, more of a norm with with these management practices and opportunities. And so the funding, I, I love, um, you know, I think that's something we need to think about is how do we uh, create that sustaining opportunity um, so it's not just a pilot or a study for many of these projects and benefits. Can, can I just offer quickly that we have in the past um, not pre-COVID, we used to offer solar grazing tours, and that that is something I'm hoping to do again. Um, and now um, I do have some funding, so hopefully we can do some digital solar grazing pasture walks. Um, so just letting you know, stay in touch, um, probably in 2021, but we can help show you where this is happening and, and, and the nuts and bolts um, uh, uh, well beyond a pilot scale. So thank you. Thank you, Lexi. On that, we're going to wrap up this first panel. Um, thank you, Stephanie and Kimberly. Um, and Lexi, to your point on tours, that leads us to what we'll get into immediately when we reconvene. We're going to have a couple of tours of some, uh, some locations here in Vermont. Um, the chat has been super active. I appreciate that. Please continue using the chat to exchange uh, ideas or links or resources and so on. Um, obviously, we can't, can't get to every question as we're going, so please make use of that. And Evan, Jordan, Lexi, and Olivia, thank you again so much. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I think, Lexi, you may need to go. Um, but we're going to take a break and we will reconvene at 1035. So please take a moment, uh, get some sun on your faces if you can, and uh, we'll meet you back here in just about just under 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>